Welcome, this is the first in a series of videos that will hopefully help you learn about object-oriented programming using the Python language. So before we start that, we're going to talk about what the heck an object actually is. So, start right up. Remember way back in biology class when you learned how every organism was classified in this hierarchical tree that was labeled with all of these things like kingdom and phylum and somebody taught you King Philip came over for gay sex so that you could remember the order of these things and from top to bottom you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. In particular here, let's uh, talk about a, an individual <coughs> species. Eukaryota, which used to be Animalia, is the kingdom. So we know it's an animal, which means the cells of its body don't have a cell wall, mostly. The next thing down is a phylum. The phylum is metazoa, which includes all multicellular organisms. So now we know that the individual in question is not a single-celled organism. Next thing is class, chordata, which essentially means it has a central nervous system. Then order, which is mammalia. And mammalia, they all have babies and they produce milk. The family is carnivora, which means that it almost exclusively only eats meat. The genus is Canidae, and that genus name implies a particular tooth co uh, configuration, and the species is Canis. So sure enough, if you remember your biology, we are talking about the taxonomy of a dog. So the common dog, or the domesticated dogs, they're all Canis lupus. Now lupus is a subspecies, and yes, all of this relates to programming. So just bear with me here for a second. So, the reason I brought that up is because terminology is important, and a lot of us hate terminology. Unfortunately, it's part of life. So, it's here to stay, learn it, love it, live it. So these are some of the terminology, some of the items that are important in object-oriented programming. So let's start with the top here. We have messages and receivers. And yep, as the name implies, in object-oriented programming, you have something that creates a message and you have something that receives that message and then acts on it. You have this thing called polymorphism, which is also called overloading, although technically it's not the same terminology. Polymorphism, um, as the name implies, means having many aspects. But moving right along, you have members or attributes, and those things are usually in three types, variables, constants, and methods. Then you have classes, which have objects and instances, then you have inheritance, encapsulation, and constructors. Finally, every object has a lifetime. All of this is um, basic or, I don't know how to say, it's essential for understanding object-oriented programming, but it is a lot like biology. So, is there any reason to learn all of these terms at once? No, because it's very difficult to understand if all you do is read definitions. But if you are OCD and you want definitions, you can go ahead and click on these two links. And sure enough, you will get a um, fancy schmancy definition. Now, I prefer thought experiments. Uh, Einstein loved those things, so no reason not to do what Einstein would have wanted us to do. So let's imagine we have all of this stuff that we want to organize, and we want to create a taxonomy tree, just like we do in biology. And we have the 10 items that are listed here on the screen. I'll give you a second to 
look at them. Now, think about a tree-like way to organize those items above before looking at the next slide. So I urge you to just think about it and take a moment and hit pause. I'm going to go right ahead to the next slide now. This is one possible way that we could categorize those vehicles. It's not the only way, obviously. And in fact, you could find a, um, a problem right away. What if you have a trailer that has more than two tires? Um, so perhaps the number of wheels is not the best uh, separation there. Maybe there's a better way, but for our purposes, Let's look at this tree, how to categorize the vehicles that we mentioned before. So for example, if we had a moped, it would go under vehicles, two-wheeled, motorized, others. If we had a bicycle, it would be vehicles, two-wheeled, non-motorized, human-powered, and so on and so forth. So what is inheritance? Inheritance is similar to the idea of passing traits from one generation to the next, but it is not in the connotation of a reproduction cycle. Let's look at, again at the taxonomy of the common dog. The canidae, or the canines, inherit all of the traits of the carnivores. The carnivores inherit all of the traits of the mammals. So you'd ask yourself, does this mean that there are no meat-eating insects? Let me ask a different question. Are there more types of mammals or more types of canines? And in particular, does being a mammal inherit from being a carnivore? Now you probably know the answers to all those things, but let's just review that. Does this mean that there are no meat-eating insects? No, indeed there are meat-eating insects. The carrion beetle or the graveyard beetle comes to mind. But they are not backboned creatures that bear live young and nurse their young with milk. Carnivora, that class, I'm sorry, that family is in the class Chordata. Insects are of the class Arthropoda, which means jointed leg. Now, perhaps, and I don't know enough about biology to answer this question, there is a class, I'm um, sorry, a genus or a family in Arthropoda that are meat eaters. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Carnivora specifically is in the class Chordata. Are there more types of mammals or canines? Well, that's obvious. There are more types of mammals. Canine is a more specialized grouping of a particular mammal. And does mammal inherit from carnivora? Nope. Inheritance is one way. It's from the top down. Carnivores inherit from mammals, but mammals do not inherit from carnivores. There are plenty of mammals that are herbivorous or omnivorous and are not in the carnivora um, uh, family, or is it a genus? doesn't matter. They're not carnivores. For example, horses or cows. Now, how does this apply to programming? Let's talk about classes and inheritance. A class in object-oriented programming is an entry in any level of that inheritance tree, let's call it a label, but it's similar to a taxonomy group at any level of the tree. So carnivore is a class, mammal is a class, jointed leg arthropods is a class, multicellular organisms is a class. A class is a set of details that applies specifically to one group. And that set of details is what separates that class from a different one. And in more exacting terms, the class only has 
the details that are specific to that group and everything below it. So the term inheritance in object-oriented programming applies exactly like in biology. All mammals have a backbone and a central nervous system inherited from chordata, but not all things with backbones are mammals. So let's think about the idea of a class and how this applies to a particular example or individual of that class. An object or an instance is very similar to an individual. My dog Tramp is an example or an instance of the species Canis. She is not the species. She is not the the embodiment, she is the uh, embodiment of canine. She is defined by canine. So her, she is a example, an instance of canis lupus. There can be a lot more instances of canis lupus. Everyone's dog is an example. So. If we look at the taxonomy of vehicles that we defined a few minutes ago, a 2020 Honda Rebel is an instance of vehicles, in particular two-wheeled vehicles, in particular motorized vehicles, in particular motorcycles, in particular street legal motorcycles. Now we can have many, many, many instances of that class. If I happen to own a 2020 Honda Rebel, that is simply one instance, one object of the class street legal, which inherits everything from motorcycles, which inherits everything from motorized, which inherits from two wheels, which inherits from vehicle. So, so far we've talked about object, instance, class and inheritance. Now, every object like a Honda Rebel has what's called a constructor procedure. Now, this is a procedure that has to run in order to create an individual instance, or an individual motorcycle. An instance, in other words, my motorcycle, my hypothetical motorcycle, cannot be created unless the constructor runs, similar to the way the factory had to go out through a construction process. And it happened at the factory, which is invisible to me, the guy that buys the motorcycle. Similarly, an object-oriented programming language constructs objects and runs through a construction process that is invisible to the user. Why is this important? Because the same way that the local Honda dealer receives new motorcycles and then it goes through a dealer prep procedure, which they charge a lot of money for, but it's done to every new motorcycle after the factory. A programmer can act like the dealer and can create an after factory constructor. This is very important in particular classes when you want to initialize certain parameters. Say, for example, the width and the height of something on the screen. In Python, this is done with the underscore underscore init underscore underscore method. Okay? Last term is encapsulation. Now, this is similar to the name rebel of that motorcycle. Honda uses the name Rebel, and so does Canon. In each case, the word Rebel, or the name Rebel, is encapsulated in the object definition, which is the class. The object definition is the class. Here, one is a motorcycle, and one is a camera. So when I refer to Rebel, and I'm talking to a bunch of motorcycle people, they know what I'm talking about. If I refer to Rebel and I'm talking to a bunch of camera people, they know what I'm talking about. You can use the same exact name, 
because the name is part of the object definition and in these cases one's a motorcycle and one's a camera. Another example is that Honda uses a fuel tank, so does a Caterpillar front loader. The Honda owner's manual says fuel tank. I'm sure that the Caterpillar owner's manual also says fuel tank. Both of them can use the same term without any confusion because fuel tank is encapsulated in the object's definition. I am trying to make these videos no more than 15 minutes and I am at that point in time so I'm going to stop it right here. Now that defines a lot of the main concepts of object-oriented programming. Until next time.